Good morning. Before we get started in the message, in just a few moments, we're going to have communion today. And there was a box back in the foyer to get a communion cup. But if you didn't get one and you'd like one, Levi's coming up the aisle. If you just raise your hand, he'll pass you one down the aisles. We're getting ready for this. So anybody that didn't get one, if you'd like one, just raise your hand. Levi will get you one. But uh, as we're getting ready to start into this, I heard something here a while back that just, man, it resonated with me about communion. And I want to share this with you this morning before we get started. And the Jews would have understood this very good at the, at the Last Supper. But back in the day, you know, we, we've always heard, and, and, and it is true, that ladies didn't have a lot of rights back in the day. But the value on a daughter was unbelievably high. And if you would go back and study in their culture about the prices that were paid for the, the bridal price for a bride, it was like unbelievable kind of prices that they'd put on the bride. But the bride's price would be decided as the father of the young man and the father of the young lady would sit at the table and, and, and they would discuss the price, but the price would finally be offered by the bridegroom to the bride and he would take a drink of the cup and then he would hand it to her and if she drank of the cup, the marriage was agreed upon. That was how the marriage was set. And so you can just imagine this because this is the way it went down. The father is the same father of us all. You understand the father of Jesus was the father of the bride, which is us, the church, and he's discussing what we are worth and he sets the price. And, or he's discussing the price, and Jesus sets the price because he tells them at the supper table, this is my blood which will be given as a ransom for many. And he drinks from the cup and hands it to them, and when they drank of the cup, they have committed themselves to him in marriage. But I want you to understand something because this is the part that gives me the willies. He set the price. Like, I would have considered my value nothing when he found me. I know where I was when he found me. And so when I was sitting on the other side of the table, if he would have said, what are you worth? I would have said nothing. I'm worth nothing. I got nothing to offer, and I'm worth nothing, and I don't even know why you'd want me. But he set the price. And he said I was worth his son, his life, his blood. And so as we go through this, understand something. He set the value on you. And he's asking you to join him in, a, in, in commitment unto him, in an intimate relationship. He wants you. And so before we get started in this, I want to give you a few moments because I think you ought to have your heart right as you go in communion. So we're getting ready to do this. We're going to take just a mo few moments of silence. And if there's anything in your heart that you're harboring that you know that God don't want you to, I want you to think about this. Is this worth separating me from God? Is what I'm holding on to worth giving up? the peace that I could have if I let go of it in God. And whatever that is, give it to him. Or ask him to, to help you with it. If you're a Christian, if Christ lives in you, and he's revealed something that's offensive in you and you haven't released it, ask him to give you the strength to release that as we go through this. Do that for just a few moments. And it says in the, in the book of Matthew, <clears throat> chapter 26, it records the, <clears throat> the Last Supper, or the, the night our Lord was crucified. And it says, uh, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and he gave thanks for it, and he broke it. 
Would one of you fellas bless the bread, please? Brother Derek has always remember, uh, mentioned, examine ourselves because it's a great price to pay for taking this in a wrong manner. So let's go to the Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, it's wonderful that we can come together this day and know that we're here because you made it possible, Lord. You gave the ultimate sacrifice, Lord. And Lord, you gave it gave yourself upon that rugged cross. Your body was abused, Lord, in such a way that I cannot explain the depth of it, Lord. But as we take this bread, remember what you ask us to do. As we take of this bread, Lord, help us to remember why that we take of this bread. And I ask all this in your wonderful name, Lord Jesus. And then he gave it to his disciples and take, said, Take and eat. This is my body. In verse 27, it says, Likewise, he took the cup and gave thanks for it. Brother Kenneth, would you bless the cup, please? As I think about this cup that holds this life in that great cup. I think about Jesus hanging on the cross and I think of the price that he paid with his blood for me. So as we partake of this cup, let's remember that this is like a marriage. We're married to one that's greater than anything there is in this world. Lord, this morning, I just want to thank you that we can observe in the presence of you, Lord, that when we take this drink, that we can know that it's going to lift us up and it's going to replace whatever is in our life that we don't want there because you paid the price for us all. I pray this in your precious name. Amen. says, then he gave, th after giving thanks, he offered it to him and said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Amen. I got myself all tangled up here again. I love to say this, and I'm going to say it now. All my life, I have considered that the Last Supper. He even says that in the heading of my Bible, but that ain't right. It's not the, the Last Supper. He even said, I won't eat of this again until I eat it anew in my Father's kingdom. And there's already another supper. The table's already set, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That ain't the last one, and I'm going to be at the next one. I always wished I could have been at that, and wouldn't that have been cool to be sitting around the table with the sun? But there's coming another, and old Derek's going to be sitting at the table because I already got a seat at the Father's table. And if you're a Christian, understand something. That's remembrance of what he's done until we're in the presence of the Son. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. But there's another day coming when we'll sit at that table with the Lamb. And that right there is awesome. If you would this morning, I want to open our service up in a word of prayer. But before I do, I need to say something about tonight. The, if you don't know what the community unity service is, that's a tongue twister, ain't it? Community unity, that's hard for me. But anyway, the community unity services are services with about eight or ten different churches go together. And uh, now they're doing it every fifth Sunday. And tonight they're going to meet at Centennial. And, and I didn't realize that it was the fifth Sunday, to tell you the truth, a few weeks ago. And, and we got so much going on at our church. We're not canceling our services at Mount Pleasant because there's a lot going on right here right now. So everything's going to be as it is normally at Mount Pleasant. But if you'd like to be at the service, and I'm going to be there tonight, 
if, if, if the good Lord willing, at Centennial at 6 o'clock. They're going to have some desserts and things after, and if you want to bring something, feel free to do that. And it's just a, a, a group of churches getting together, and they'll have some worship music, and they'll have a message, and uh, it's, it's just getting together and loving on Jesus is all it is. And so if you want to come out tonight, it'll be tonight at 6 o'clock at Centennial Baptist Church on West Lane. If that being said, bow with me as we open up in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for being a good, good father. Thank you, Father God, for setting us free. God, you set the price and paid it that we might have eternal life, God, and the price pleased the Father. And I want to thank you for that. And it pleased the Father to be united back with us. And Father God, we have no hope without Jesus. And I just praise your holy name, Lord God, for what you've done through your Son and are doing through your Son in our lives. And just in this service today, God, I ask for a great favor. Give me clarity, Lord, on what I studied and help me understand the things I don't understand and hide me behind the cross. And I just ask you to let your Holy Spirit unleash in this place, God. I just ask forgiveness for my failures and my filthy mistakes, Lord, and the ways that I come up short. But I ask you, Lord, to let no offensive way remain in me. Lord, help me lay those things at your feet and thank you for revealing them to me. And I pray as we go through this service that, Lord, we might be... Uh, Open our minds to the truth, God, and if it's conviction that it brings, it's because you want to set us free. And, Lord, that's what I pray you do is bring freedom in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we were at, ended at Romans 8, 17, and to just kind of get it right off on it there, I want to begin today in Romans 8, 17, a powerful verse that, that Paul says, and I want to talk about what it means, and I didn't. I, I kind of come up short on that last week, but Romans 8, 17 says these words, Now if we are children, that's God's children, then we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His suffering, in order that we may also share in His glory. Man, this is a tough verse, and, 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 and Ralph last night, uh, last Sunday night, he even told me under the bus and asked me to explain this a little bit. And I'm going to try to do that today, and it's a very hard thing to explain, so I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will help me in this. But first of all, I want to talk about sharing in the suffering of God. Now, I want you to understand something. I want everybody to have a relationship with Jesus, amen? But a relationship with Jesus is not for the tenderfoot or the powder puff generation. You know what I'm talking about? A relationship with Jesus is hard, right? And there's a reason it's hard. Now, the Bible talks about ways we'll be persecuted. And one of the ways we'll be persecuted is we're going to be hated by the world. Jesus said, they hated me, and they'll surely hate you because of me. Now, Lisa, I know, has a great heart for persecuted Christians, and I do too. And we talk about the persecution around the world. And there are Christians living in hostile countries right now. And they say that there are more martyrs now than ever been in any other time before. Is that not right? There's a lot of martyrs in our world that's dying for their faith. Now, we live in America, and in America, we haven't, we're, not seeing, we're not seeing people die for their faith. We have. And it may get a lot worse and probably will. But I want to tell you something. You're still going to get persecuted because of your faith. Now, sometimes people ask me, they say, they're going to ask you a question. When you get saved, how do you sort through your friends? How do you know which ones to keep? And which ones to loosen your grip on? And I say this, you follow Jesus and get in step with the Holy Spirit and they'll sort yourself. Right? Because, now you don't need to tell any of me, dude, I can't hang out with you anymore. All right? You need to bring a little Jesus with you wherever you go. And they'll decide whether they want to hang out with you or not. If you live it, they're either going to, they're either going to see the light or run from the light. One of the two, Right? A lot of times, they, the light becomes repulsive to your friends. And it's not that you're on your soapbox preaching. It's just the fact that you're not who you used to be. And i got to tell you something. Do you realize that you can strike a single match, and in pitch black darkness, the naked eye can see it over a mile out? One match. A naked eye can see it a mile out in pitch black darkness because light, just a little bit of light, shines up in the dark. You know what I mean? And, and, and sometimes people are, 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 are offended by the light. You know, they're offended by the truth. They're offended by people that are living for Christ. And so they'll pull away, and that's, a, that, that's, that's persecution. And, and, man, I hear this kind of stuff all the time because sometimes it ain't your enemy that you're persecuted by. It's your family. 
All of a sudden, your family looks at you like you are weird. And I know there's Christians in this room that know about those kinds of things, right? Because now that you are following Jesus more closely, there's some things that you're just not a part of anymore. And that's persecution. Suffering in the flesh, right? You're, you're, you're going to be hated because he's hated. But in this verse, that's not what he's talking about. See, what he's been talking about is what he's still talking about. And he's talking about the battle with the spirit and the flesh. Okay, that's what he's talking about. That's the suffering he's talking about here. Now, the world doesn't understand that. And the reason they don't understand that, and I hope you've got this over the last few weeks, is they only have the physical nature. You know, you go back to John 3, 16, and Jesus talked with Nicodemus, and he said, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. And Nicodemus, intelligent, intelligent man, but he might not exactly be the sharpest tool in the shed. He was following along real good, and he said, I don't understand that. How am I supposed to get back in my mama's womb? Right? And Jesus said, wait a minute, you don't understand, Nicodemus. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Like, your mama gave you the life in the flesh, right? And everything comes with it, the flesh. Everybody that has the flesh has the tendency to sin. The flesh always desires what is contrary to the spirit. Now, we've talked about this in great detail. We don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this. But how many people does it, if you could really honestly say, does it come natural to you to love others greater than yourself? I have never seen anybody born like that. My kids were selfish little suckers, you know what I'm talking about? And I never even tried to work on them with it. I never even said, you don't need to let anybody have your stuff, right? If anybody tries to take your stuff, lay down in the thrower, kick and scream and throw a fit, hit them, do whatever you got to do, just don't let them take your junk. Now, I didn't have to tell them that. They figured it right out, right? And I'm going to tell you something. I had two little girls, and little girls are precious things. But i got to tell you something. If you think little girls won't get into it, <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Woo! I mean, sometimes they would get in it, you know, I wouldn't write over things that they just got because they was selfish, right? You took my stuff. You think they'd outgrow it when they get older, but teenage girls, it gets worse. <laughs> if anybody's had teenage girls, they know what I'm talking about up in here because you got in my closet and you got my, oh my Lord. And, and, and so it's like stressful, right? Loving others above yourself doesn't come natural to us. It, it does, though, in the spirit. In the spirit, but not in the flesh. So the world, they don't understand that because they only have a fleshly nature. But now we got a spiritual nature. And so I want you to grasp this going on here. You have born with a fleshly nature that hates what God longs for. You say, no, not really. I don't hate what God longs for. Forgiving people who really don't deserve it. You don't hate that? I mean, that comes easy to you to forgive people? Yeah, right. <laughs> Y'all can lie to somebody else. I'll never believe that. Right? Sharing comes natural to you. The things that you really don't want to share, did you share them or did you hide them so nobody else could find them? Right? Because that's the way we roll. Like in the flesh, we hate the things God asks us for. And that's why when Jesus was in the Sermon on the Mount, everybody was looking at him like he had two hits. He was saying... Pray for your enemies. Love those that persecute you. Right? If they tell you you got to pack their stuff one mile, pack it two. And everybody was out there saying, like, I've been having some trouble with my hearing lately. Is he saying what I think he's saying? Because that is totally contrary of our flesh. But the Spirit, God promised that he would put his Spirit in us and give us a desire for his will. Now, Paul, he does a really good job of explaining this in Romans chapter 7. But he says, I know what I want to do. Like, I want to do what God wants me to do. And I got great intentions to do it. But my sinful fleshly nature keeps getting in my way. And I keep seeing something in me that reminds me of who I used to be. And I hate it. It, it makes me cringe. It makes me disgusted. It makes me sick. I hate who I used to be, and I don't want to be that guy anymore, but I keep tripping over that guy. And then he says, who will rescue me from this body of death, this wretched man I am? Now, you don't have to raise your hand if you feel uncomfortable, but does that sound familiar to you? Like, like I totally get what he's talking about. 
Because this, and there is great suffering in living with two natures. Right? Like some people say that Paul wrote Romans 7 after he got saved. And I say, have you ever realized what you're saying? Before I got saved, I didn't struggle with the flesh. I embraced it. Right? Like I was ashamed of what I was doing and I would sit in church and listen to the message and be ashamed of it. But I had plans of doing it again after this thing's over. And, and I'm, saying, I'm ashamed of saying that, but that's the truth. I have asked God for forgiveness and stuff while I was doing it. That ain't repentance. That's Lord, don't punish me for being a sinner. Nowhere in Scripture did God ask us for an apology. He asked for a repentant heart. Right? That's what he wanted, a repentant heart. That means a changed mind, not some cheap apology. And I've apologized to God for my sin so many times, knowing good and well I was going to do it again. I was that guy, right? And then all of a sudden, God gave me this new desire. And, and, and sin made me sick. And at the same time, I kept running to it. That bothers a lot of people. And if it bothers you, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I, I want to get to something here. We're going to share in the suffering of Jesus. And you say, Jesus suffered this way? Oh, yeah. He was sinless, but he suffered this way. Read with me in Hebrews chapter 4. I love this passage of Scripture right here. Hebrews chapter 4. And it says this. Therefore, since we have a high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the, this is verse 14, Hebrews 4, 14. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now let me ask you something. Now this is, this is, a, this is Bible trivia kind of questions right here. Is God the Father, is He ever tempted? No, that's right. James says, God doesn't tempt anyone, nor is he tempted. God the Father is never, ever, ever tempted. Temptation has never been around God the Father. He is holy, and he dwells in holiness, and he's never been tempted to do wrong. But Jesus, it says, has been tempted in every way. And the word every way there, it's a really cool Hebrew word, or actually a Greek word. And the word is pas, P-A-S, and it simply means all forms of. That's simply what it means. That Jesus has had all forms of temptation. Now, God the Father is never tempted, but Jesus has had all forms of temptation. Why? He put on the flesh, right? He became, and so I want you to grab something because this is really hard for people. Jesus was not half God and half man. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. He took on all the weaknesses of the flesh, yet he remained sinless because he had all the perfection and the majesty of the Father. But he has had all forms of temptation. So let, let, me, let me get this in your head, all right? He understands dealing with anxiety. Anybody deal with anxiety? You have no, that's the new word. New word, anxiety. It's, it's, it's the new, I don't have to. I can't go talk to my neighbor, it gives me anxiety. I mean, this is the new, this is the new crutch, right? I can't talk to people about Jesus, give me anxiety. I can't stop worrying, not worrying, give me anxiety. Right? Everything gives everybody anxiety, and it's the big excuse, I don't have to do it. And the Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, make your request to God. You don't think Jesus struggled with anxiety? Let me tell you something. He's been greatly tempted with anxiety. He's been greatly tempted with worry. We know the three fears in the desert, right? First was hunger, natural desire. Anybody ever been tempted by natural desire? 
You know, food is natural desire. Love is natural desire. Intimacy is natural desire. You ever struggle with those temptations of natural desire? It's something that's good that God, that Satan's trying to turn bad on you. Jesus has been down that street. He understands that Satan can use natural desire to really cross you up if you ain't careful. But he was sinless in it. Fear. I want to tell you something. I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus was afraid of the cross. But his faith in the Father was greater than his fear. You don't sweat drops of blood because you're excited about something. Right? He struggled with it. He has had all forms of temptation. He understands where you are. And so when you're filled with anxiety and you come to Jesus, understand something. You're talking to a God who has walked where you walked and endured. He overcome. I want to tell you something. That gives me great comfort. Because like you can talk to me about your struggles. And, and a lot of people do, and I'm glad they do. And I got big ears. I'm a good listener. But here's the thing. I can't even fix me. Right? And so, like, all I can really do, and if you've ever sat with me and talked on a personal level, is share my struggles with you while you share your struggles with me. And I can encourage you in the Scripture, and you can encourage me in the Scripture, but I can't fix you because I don't even know how to fix me. But I know who does. And I know the times that he's given me strength when I didn't have it. And I know the times he's picked me up when I was down. And I know the ways he's helped me overcome my temptation by opening my eyes and taking away the pleasure, the power, and the presence of sin in a lot of places in my life. And so I can share with you that I have a God who understands and can overcome. Now you say, where are you going with this? Let me tell you. I'm talking about you praying. That's where I'm going to. It says this. Listen to this last verse right here. It says, For we don't have a high priest who's unsympathetic with our weakness. We have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. How many people ever prettied your prayer up? I mean, I'm, I'm being serious up in here. How many people have ever got down on their knees with the Father and told Him the G-rated version of what you got going on in your life? Right? Why do we do that? We think God ain't big enough to hear it. He knows He's going to do it for you, doesn't it? I mean, God's seen Sodom and Gomorrah. You think you've done something, He's going to be a, say, oh, oh, oh. But we come to God and we give him this G-rated kid version of our actual sin and we kind of pretty it up and put a little perfume on it, paint its toenails and try to make it look good to God. Instead of bringing the nasty, ugly truth to him and saying, God, this is what I am and I don't know how to fix it, but I want to. And I know you can because you've overcome all things. Help me put to death my flesh that I can live for your glory. Now, i got to tell you something. There's great freedom in coming clean with God. Woo, there's great freedom in coming clean with God. There's great freedom in bringing your mess to God. I want to tell you something. There was something really cool between Adam and Eve's relationship before sin. I talk about this at a lot of marriage counseling. Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. Right? They, they were both exposed to one another. Think about this for a minute. There was nothing about Adam that Eve didn't know and nothing about Eve that Adam didn't know and they were perfectly okay with knowing everything about each other. There was nothing about each other that made any shame between them. That's awesome, right? I want to tell you something. That's what the Father wants with us. The moment they sinned, what did they do? They hid, right? And they'd done something. They tried to cover up their shame. Try to make it look better. Put on the fig leaf attire. And, and so Adam and Eve made them some duds out of fig leaves. And they're walking around the garden in their fig leaves. They've covered up their shame with one another. And they hear a voice. Whose voice was it? God. God's walking in the garden. And then what they do? Yeah. You understand, their effort to cover up their shame was worthless when they come in the presence of the Father. 
Right? They've done everything they know how to do to cover up their shame, right? They got it all covered up. It's all cool now. Until they hear the voice of the Father. And then they run. And they hide. And God says, Adam. I love this verse. Tim knows what I'm getting ready to say. Adam, where are you? Let me ask you something. Why does an old knowing God ask somebody? God is like the best hide and seek player ever. Right? You can't go anywhere. He don't know where you're at. I mean, the psalmist says, if I go to the highest heavens, you're there. Or to the depths of the sea, you're there. Where are you going to go that God don't know where you're at? So why did he ask Adam where you're at? He wanted Adam to tell him. He said, Adam, where are you at? Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit? He set him up for repentance. He asked all the questions Adam needed to answer. God, I messed up. I listened to the serpent. I ate of the tree. I messed up. I done everything you told me not to do. And I'm so ashamed of myself. And I'm so sorry. God, please help me. That's all he wanted. What did Adam do? He done the flesh thing. He tried to cover up his own shame, ran and hid from God. How many of us, even as Christians, are still trying to hide our sin from the Father? Right? We're trying to give him the pretty version. And they're like, it's insane because I want to tell you something. That's religion. And let me tell you what religion is. Religion will love you all the way to hell. That's what religion will do. Religion loves to make sin look pretty. To give it a new name. We've been new naming sin like crazy in our generation. Right? Just take all the sins and give it a new name and call it all right. But it ain't all right. No matter what you call it, no matter what you do, no matter how much you try to cover it up, sin is still sin, and it'll bring shame in your life. Right? So if you're doing junk you know you ought not do, and the Holy Spirit's living in you, you ain't going to have no peace. Now, I want to say that this morning in love, because I have been there. And the reason I want to say this is because I still got two natures, and I totally understand. I totally understand, right? Because we have this nature that will run back to sin. I'm going to have to quote C.S. Lewis here. When the saints say that they are no longer sinners, they are foolish and they put a halo around their own stupid head. So if you get to thinking, I'm past that, Satan loves where you're standing, right? Guard yourself. The Bible says be sober-minded and alert and guard yourself. The enemy of the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And so we need to be honest with God and say, God, my nature is vile. I can be the most selfish person I know. I expected an amen, Becky. Yeah. Right? Like I can be selfish. I know I can. I don't need anybody to tell me God has already revealed that in me. I can be selfish. And I don't need a real good excuse. Right? Like when I was a kid, and this is just thinking back on this blows my mind. When I was a kid, I always thought that I had the hardest job. You ever remember that? When I was a kid and we was housed in the back, and daddy tried to get me out of the way, so he'd get these dang wires. And had me put the leaves that fell off on them wires. And I'd be down there on the ground. Everybody else be doing all what I thought was the cool stuff, right? And I'm down here putting these leaves on these wires. And I say, these stupid wires. i got to do all the hard work. I'll be glad when I get to help do the other work. <laughs> then I got a little bigger. Daddy said, put that wire down. Get up on the top of that barn. And I got up on the top of that barn. And I was like, this is stupid. i got to get all the way up here in the top. I'll be glad when I get big enough to get down there lower. Then a couple years went down, and Daddy said, right? And then I was saying, this is stupid. i got to get up here in this barn and do all this hard work. I'll be glad when I'm the guy that can stay on the wagon and push it up. Then I got to big enough to do that. Then I said, God, I wish I could put those leaves on those wires. <laughs> right? But in my mind, no matter where you put me, everybody else has got it easy because they're about to work me to death up in here. Right? That is a selfish mindset. That is looking at you so much that you can't see what everybody else is doing. Right? Apply that to your marriage. 
How many times in your marriage have you almost made everybody miserable because you were so focused on yourself you couldn't see what everybody else was doing? I've done it. What about with your children, your family? What about the church? You know how many churches have been destroyed because somebody believed that they were in a tough spot and nobody else was doing anything? And on so focused on herself, he couldn't see what everybody else was doing. Whoo! How many people have questioned God because they're so focused on herself they can't understand the big picture? What about Job? One of my favorite passages of scripture in Job is after God got unquestioned, he said, Job, dress yourself like a man. Meet me on it. Because Job been wanting to talk to God. 20 years he'd been wanting to talk to God. God showed up and said, Get yourself dressed, boy. Dress like a man. Meet me on the side of this mountain because we're fixing to talk. You want to talk? We're fixing to talk. Job's out there with God, and God says, where was you at when I hung the world on nothing? Told the ocean this how far it could go. Where was you at when I put the teeth in the crocodile's mouth? Where were you? He goes on and on and on, and you know what Job's response was? God, I'll put my hand over my mouth, and I will never speak to you that way again. Right? He was so focused on Job that he couldn't see the big picture. But man, all of a sudden, he could see the big picture. And i got to tell you something. We are in our flesh so subject to center our little eyes on our little portion of the picture and say, God, I don't understand all this. This ain't fair. This ain't right. What are you doing? Let me tell you something. I want you to grasp what I'm about to say because this is getting ready to give me the willies, and I hope it does you. I'm going to share in his suffering, and am sharing in his suffering, but he's bringing me to share in his glory. Now, I'm about to love what I'm about to tell you, but this is... Uh, the word, my Greek is rusty, to say the least. And I didn't talk to Nick about this before, should have. But the word is doxa, is how I, the best I can say. There you go. Thank you, Nick. Brother, need a little help up in here. And, and the word means, well, let me, let me give you the, the real version of what the word means, because I don't want to get this wrong. The word means opinion judgment or view now listen to this involving the estimate of someone's worth let me explain it to you here you're going to share in jesus's suffering but you're also going to share in his worth what does it mean to share in the glory of the son i'm glad you asked when we get to heaven nobody's going to think you're equal to the son nobody when we get to heaven, everybody's going to fall on their face because everybody that's ever been in his presence did, right? And in heaven, it never stops. Can we put the Revelation chapter 5 verse up on the wall? This is a constant praise in heaven. So if praise music bothers you, heaven's really going to annoy you, okay? But this is heaven's band. This is the angels and the 24 elders and all the creatures saying... In a loud voice they were singing, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. For the rest of eternity when we get to heaven, we're going to be saying, Worthy is the Lamb! Worthy is the Lamb! You're going to live your eternal life and everything you're going to do is going to honor the Lamb. All right, so you're not going to see yourself as worthy of Jesus in heaven. But the Father is. He has imputed to you or put on you the worth of the Son. Right? You, you understand what I said? He set the bridal price. I talked to you about that in communion. When he looks at you, he values you the same as he values Jesus. Your righteousness is of that of Christ. I want you to get you some of that. I don't care what you've done. All the shame that you've packed in this place. If Jesus is your Savior, the Father looks at you worth as much as the Son. Get you some of that. The Father looks at you and you're as worthy as the Son. You have the same amount of heaven as the Son. You are allowed in His presence as much as the Son. You are expected in His presence as much as the Son, He has made all the arrangements. There's a room in His house and a seat is His table. You are given the work. Jesus took your sin that you might become His. 
Oh, yeah. That's what you're worth. When the Father appraised you, you were worth the Son. I don't want to get an amen right there. I mean, you got to get your hand up. I mean, how many times has Satan told you how little you're worth? That, that song we've been singing, Chosen. How many times have you wrestled with feeling unworthy? Outside looking in, like you and your sin don't belong. i got to tell you something. You have no idea how many times I've heard that discussion with Satan. You have no idea how many times it's went down like this. You're going to get up there and talk to him this week? You? You know who you are. You know what you're struggling with. You know the mistakes you made. You know you ain't got it all together. What are you going to do when they all find out what you really are? You better step down. That's what you better do. Because you're no good. And I ain't no good on my own. But the holy, the Hagias Numa, the Holy Spirit's living in me, and he has deemed me holy. And I'm worth the same amount as the Son. And every time Satan does that, it's like Jesus steps up with that big bloody hand and wipes the slate and says, what do you think about that, chump? Right? Because I got this one. Listen to this word. Listen to Romans 8, 18. You got you to get this because this is awesome. We're not going any farther than Romans 8, 18 today, so just stay calm. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Let me ask you something. What's your biggest worry in life right now? Your biggest worry. Now, don't tell anybody. Put it up here. But what is your... Now, I'm being real. Play along for just a few minutes, and then we're going to shut this baby down. What is your biggest worry? What worries you the most? What keeps you the most awake at night? What is the hardest worry you have to give to Jesus? That's the first question. The second question is this. What is your, what is your biggest fear? The biggest fear you have in life right now. The, if this goes wrong, I don't know what I'll do. What is your biggest fear? Let me ask you something. What do they mount to in kingdom time? What does it mount to? Jesus said, what are you worried about? Why do you store up your treasure on earth where thieves and rust is going to destroy? Let me tell you something. Whatever you got in a few years, so one of these days somebody's going to drive past Johnny Lake's place. He's going to be dead. Yeah. And they're going to say, that's where old man Lakes used to live right there. Used to live. Because he ain't going to be there no more. Somebody's going to drive past Tim's house and say, that's where old man Darling lives. I remember old man Darling. But he's going to be dead and gone. Right? When people ask me, they say, now where do you live? And I say, down there on, you live down there at old Trahoon place, don't you? I reckon I do. I never did met Mr. Trahoon, but everybody tells me that's where he used to be. <laughs> so I reckon I live at old man Trahoon place. Right? And one of these days, my house, they'll say, I know you. You live down there where old man Baker lives. I remember that old man right in the way, all that. Huh? Because that's what I, that old man that had that serious ear hair. I told Becky, I'm going to be one of those bad guys with serious ear hair one of these days. You know, I, it's inevitable. I'm seeing it coming. You know what I mean? So everybody's going to say, I know that guy. All the things that I got in this life, one of these days is going to be in somebody else's name. And I'm sitting around worried about I'm going to lose it when God's like, I hate to let you in on this, but you are. It may not be today and it may not be tomorrow, but you ain't going to have that much longer. You might as well just come to the grips with it that this is a temporary fix here. We are spiritual and we're waiting on an eternal glory. Now that fear and that worry you got, whenever you walk through that pearl gate, and you see the throne, and you see the river of life flowing from the throne and the tree of life on each side of it, and God says, drink it up, my son, drink your fill. Well done, my good and faithful one. Welcome to your reward. How much do you think that worry's going to mean? I mean, who gives a riff, right? 
And if you could, if you know it's coming and you know you got it, let me ask you something. Why ain't you rejoicing? We're going to have a hymn of invitation, and I want to ask one more thing before we do this. Do you know it's yours? Because I ask a lot of people this question. If you die, where would you go? And they say, I hope heaven. I hope it would. Folks, I want to tell you something. If I die, I'm going to heaven. And it ain't because of what I've done, because I've done it all wrong. But he done it right. And he's my Lord and my Savior, and he's washed my slate, and he's got my back, and my sins are gone as far as the east is from the west. And I've been imputed his righteousness, and I've been given a share in his glory. God values me as the son, and I want to tell you something. There ain't no place in this world that you can go that anybody with a brain would tell you Jesus don't have a place in the Father's presence. He's the Father's son. I, he's going to be there. And as sure as he is, I am too. Because I share in the glory of the Son. So I don't have much to hope for some days. Right? If you get up in the morning and hope nothing goes wrong, how much you got to hope for? Right? The Bible says that outwardly we're wasting away. I was going to have this verse put up on the wall, but for short, I'm just going to Outwardly we're wasting away, but inwardly we're renewed day by day. So we do not give up hope. Folks, don't give up hope. Don't give up hope because sometimes people get so sick of working on their stuff that they just give it up and they say, I can't do it. I can't do it. I want to go on and let you in on the secret. You can't do it. And he didn't ask you to. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 13, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. He's doing it for you and in you. And all you got to do is be willing. So I'm going to ask this one more question right here and then I'm going to hush. Are you holding on to something tighter than you and eternal life? Is there one thing or two things or three things in your life that Jesus has really never had charge of? You say, Lord, I give it to y'all, but I ain't giving you my relationship because I want to hold on to this. I know it ain't exactly what you want, but I love this too much to give it to you, Lord. Wrong. How in the world can you give everything to Jesus but that? You got to give that to him and let him have his way. And then you'll have peace. It passes all understanding. What about money? What about worry? You say, Lord, I can't stop worrying. Everybody worries, I don't I? You realize that worrying is telling your problem it's bigger than your God. And faith is telling your worry that your God is bigger than it. They are total opposites. Right? So we're going to have a hymn of invitation. This is the way I'm going to leave it. You know your story. You know your mess. Bring it to the Father. If you've never been saved, if you don't know for sure that Jesus lives in your heart, won't you come? And if you do, and there's some junk in your closet that needs gotten rid of, and you know it, bring the truth to the Father and leave it laying right there. Because that's your only hope. Won't you come as we sing our invitation hymn?